Friends, hello and welcome to another episode in the teaching series and more specifically in our Zacchaeus series. We are going to continue looking at the story today and actually as I was reviewing last week's teaching, I saw the ending and said, I never told them what was to come next. If I'm them, I would be thinking that this week's teaching is answering the questions and then the series is done. Au contraire, that was my fault. I've got a couple more things that I want to tackle in this Zacchaeus series. And so we're going to continue on, so continue to leave questions at the end of each of the teachings. You've already left a number of questions, and I'm really looking forward to the last episode in this Zacchaeus series in order to answer the questions that you have. But now, for today's episode, here's what I want to look at. This is the last verse in the story, Luke 19, 10. Jesus says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. I want to look at two phrases here. Jesus uses the phrase Son of Man, and he uses a phrase to seek and save the lost. And I want to argue and contend that these are what we call remez or remezim. Remez is just a Hebrew word that means hint. And here's the idea. It's a practice of mentioning a key word or phrase that would hint at a passage from the Hebrew scriptures with the assumption that the audience would know its broader meaning and context and then import that context into the current teaching moment. And this is what rabbis and teachers would do all of the time. Now, at first read, at first listen, you may go, that sounds a little bit confusing. Think of it this way. Every single time you quote a movie line in a conversation, you're engaging in a remes. Because you're basically quoting that movie line, understanding or believing that your audience there will know what movie it comes from and what the context was in that movie when that line was given. And they would bring that into the present moment, oftentimes to make the moment more hilarious. That's how we often use remez as like kind of a modern day thing. And so what I believe Jesus is doing here, by the way, this is all over the scriptures. This is all over the gospels. Jesus is constantly taking us back to the Hebrew story. And this is something significant to always keep at the front of our mind. The Old Testament is Jesus' Bible. It is Jesus' story. His story is in light of the larger story and the larger story that has come before, which is known as the Hebrew Scriptures. And so Jesus sees everything he's doing in light and in response to the story that has come before him. So here's one of the things that I just want to recommend to you is a group by the name of The Bible Project. You've heard me talk about them before. And if you haven't been to thebibleproject.com, I'd highly recommend going over there. But they do all of these short animated videos and they've done every single book of the Bible and they've done themes and they're doing all kinds of series now and it's just brilliant work. And here's one in particular and I'll have this thing linked um, underneath the teaching at walkingthetext.com. This is a 12 minute animated video they did on the entire Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament. And I would just highly recommend just watching this and just being reminded of what the whole storyline has been leading up to the time of Jesus because Jesus is constantly interacting with the biblical story of the Older Testament. Now, one of the things that that I did is that I did a 73 minute teaching on the entire Bible from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And I'm gonna be referring to this a number of times and you can get a more stylized graphic of this um, on my website in the sermon library, just called The Restoration of All Things. A number of you have heard me reference this before, but I'm gonna come back to this because it kind of gives us a bit of a timeline leading up to Jesus when we talk about how Jesus is interacting with uh, the particular story. Okay, but this is something we always need to recognize. This is one big unified story, and Jesus is constantly taking us back to previous times, and he's interacting and engaging, and one of the ways he does that is through remes, because he says a key word or a phrase, and you go back to the Hebrew scriptures, and you go, oh man, this seems to be what Jesus is doing here. Now, when Jesus uses this phrase, son of man, 
Um, he uses this a lot in the Gospels. And here's where it gets a bit confusing, is that in one context, Jesus will use Son of Man one way. In another context, he'll use Son of Man another way. And in this particular teaching, um, I want to highlight two ways in which I think Jesus is pulling together when he uses this phrase here at the end of the Zacchaeus story. But the first time we really see the Son of Man language is in the midst of the exile. So Israel has been exiled. Technically, it was Judah when the uh, kingdom divided. The northern kingdom was Israel. They were taken out in 722 by Assyria. But then in 586 BC, BC, that was like the devastating um, deportation and crushing of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, is that you have the Babylon is, is kind of on the world stage, and it's in the midst of the exile that you have two very key prophets who are using the language of Son of Man, and they're actually using it differently. One is Ezekiel, and one is Daniel. Now, in the midst of the deportations, there was actually four deportations when Babylon took over the southern kingdom. There was one in 605, Daniel is in that one. In 597, Ezekiel is in that one. And then you have 586, which was the big one, and then you have another one in 582. But that's why this 586 date is here. Now, Daniel, I want to look at Daniel. This is during the, the, the period of exile, and Daniel in chapter 7 has this vision and he recounts it. And notice this language in verses 13 to 14. Daniel writes, In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man. Hmm, hmm, hmm. Coming with the clouds of heaven, he approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So Daniel catches his vision. He gets his vision of someone like a son of man, and he is basically given all glory, all power over all of the nations. And this is Daniel's vision. Now, this is coming in the midst of Daniel chapter 7, and here is the Bible Project's um, piece on the book of Daniel. And again, I'll link this one as well um, underneath the, the video at walkingthetext.com. Again, eight, nine minutes or something, you get the whole book of Daniel. And what they've done, just a brilliant job here of helping us to see that chapter 7, which is where this comes in from the passage we just read, is linked to chapter 2 in the literary design of Daniel. Now, in Daniel chapter 2, the king receives a vision and it ultimately comes out that this is in connection to four different nations. So just on this restoration of all things piece, we're dealing with the period where Babylon is on the world stage. And then following Babylon, you have Persia. And then following them, you have Greece on the world stage as far as ruling the world. And then you have the Romans. And this is why I just wanted to show you that because in Daniel chapter 2, with the interpretation, is this idea that you're going to have these four nations are going to rise up. And again, that fourth one is Rome. And then in verse 44, this is what we read. In the time of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it will itself endure forever. Now, this kingdom that's being referenced is first told in 2 Samuel chapter 7, where David is promised that his son, uh, or excuse me, that his, 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 his heritage is going to have an everlasting kingdom. And so the language of son of David becomes really important here. And that's all the way back in the monarchy period. So when we have this, and the prophecy here is that that everlasting kingdom promise to David and his descendants is going to happen when this fourth kingdom comes on the world stage, and that is Rome. And so Jesus is born in the midst of Rome being on the world stage, and the prophecy of Daniel is, is this is where God's everlasting kingdom is going to pick up steam. And in Daniel chapter 7, the one who's going to be behind that is the one who is like a son of man.
And so when Jesus shows up on the scene and he calls himself the son of man, any audience, good Jewish audience would go, oh my goodness, he is hearkening us back to the prophecies all the way back in the exile period with Daniel. Friends, this is absolutely huge. This is not just Jesus helping somebody who's not been living a righteous life and now they're living a righteous life. Jesus says, for the Son of Man came. The Son of Man is here and he is getting back the world. That the whole forces of evil and brokenness and sin and death entered in in the midst of Genesis 3. And Jesus goes, I am reclaiming my world. I am getting it back. And in actions of what Zacchaeus is doing, Jesus goes, oh yeah, the Son of Man is here. And he's come to seek and to save the lost. So let's look at this one as well, to seek and save the lost, because this is really powerful Remez language as well. Now, one of the most dominant motifs in the entire scriptures is that of a shepherd and shepherding. It begins in the Exodus story, Pharaoh was a shepherd of Egypt, he had his shepherd's crook and his flail. I mean, if you've ever seen pictures of Egyptian pharaohs, you've got that. And in the midst of this, Israel's enslaved to this shepherd. And God goes, in order for this whole plan to happen, I made promises all the way back in Genesis chapter 12 to Abram. I made a covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And as a result of Israel being in um, enslaved in Egypt, God goes, I need to get them out, bring them to myself. And then God shepherds the people. And God was supposed to be the shepherd. God was supposed to be the, the king of the people of Israel. But we find out that when it comes to the monarchy, the people ask for a king. And so they get their king. And so we recognize that if a monarch is now on the scene, and up to this point, God was supposed to be the monarch. God was supposed to be the king. He was also called the shepherd. And we see this language back with Pharaoh in Egypt. It doesn't surprise us that the language of shepherding would then also be applied to the monarchs. And we see this with David in 1 Chronicles 11, 1 to 2. One to Two, here is uh, one of the parallel passages. There's another parallel passage in Kings. But when it comes to this, you have a passage here where Israel gathered to David at Hebron and said, Behold, we are your bone and your flesh. In times past, even Saul was king. You are the one who let out and brought in. So Saul was never called a shepherd. When David comes on the scene, this is all shepherding language. And the Lord your God said to you, you shall shepherd my people Israel and you shall be prince over my people Israel. And so you have God was supposed to be a shepherd to the people and was a shepherd to the people. But then the monarchs were also shepherds to the people. But then also the Israel leadership was considered to be a shepherd to the people. And this whole system fails. It goes under and you see just how devastating it is with the exile of the southern kingdom to Babylon. Now, in the midst of the exile, 597 is when Ezekiel is exiled, is you have the writings of Ezekiel. He's in Babylon and he has a vision. And we have this book known as Ezekiel. And again, here's the Bible Project's outline of and visual outline of Ezekiel. Again, I'll link this in the, uh, the bottom of the teaching. And this is why we want to be able to do this, by the way. Let me just take a quick pause on all of this. Is that when Jesus is using language that is connecting us back, we want to go back and not only find where is it coming from, but we want to understand the context. We want to understand where are we in the midst of the whole storyline and where are we in the midst of the particular book uh, that Jesus is pulling from. Because when Ezekiel is doing this, he's got this vision that the presence of God leaves and goes to Babylon. It's symbolizing that God has joined Israel in its exile. And the people ultimately want to come back from exile, but there is judgment because Israel has failed. But then after you have the judgment sections, you have these hope sections, this whole section on hope, first for Israel, then for the nations, and then for all of creation. And the chapter that launches the section on hope is Ezekiel 34. 
Now, for many of us, we go, but I don't know what's in Ezekiel 34. And that's why I just want to read to you what is in Ezekiel 34, because the chapter itself starts off with strong, strong judgment. It's almost as if that this is the linchpin moving from judgment to hope, but the chapter starts off in judgment and God is railing against the shepherds of Israel for failing to do their job to take care of the people. God uses the language, my flock. So listen to this. This is verse one. The word of the Lord came to me, son of man. Interesting. Now, I would argue and contend that when Jesus is using this in Luke 19, he's referring to Daniel chapter 7, but I also believe when Jesus says to seek and save the lost, that this is a remez found here in this chapter of Ezekiel 34. And it's interesting because when it starts off, God calls Ezekiel a son of man. Now, Ezekiel is not the person in Daniel chapter 7 who's going to rule the world. But again, there's another facet to how the language of son of man is being used. And it's in this context of this chapter. Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Woe to you shepherds of Israel who only take care of yourselves. Should not shepherds take care of the flock? Verse 4, you have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick or bound up the injured. You have not brought back the strays or searched for the lost. Verse 6, my sheep wandered all over the mountains on every high hill. They were scattered over the whole earth and no one searched or looked for them. And then in verse 8, God talks about how they lack a shepherd. And then at the end of chapter, verse 8, because my shepherds did not search for my flock. So again, God is railing on the shepherds. At the end of verse 10, God goes, I will rescue my flock. Verse 12, as shepherds look after his scattered flock when he is with them, so I will look after my sheep. I will rescue them from all the places where they were scattered. Verse 15, I myself will tend my sheep and have them lie down, declares the Lord. Verse 16, I will search for the lost and bring back the strays. And God just keeps going on. And this whole chapter is about God saying, the leadership of Israel as a shepherd to my, fee- uh, to my people, they have failed. They have failed the flock. And God goes, I am going to do something about that. I am going to seek and save the lost. I am going to search them out. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And then you come to verse 23. And what I want to do is just show you just from a glance. Here's that First Chronicles passage again. Everything highlighted. David, let out, brought in, shepherd my people, prince, all of this. And in Ezekiel 34, verses 23, notice the language God says. Then I will set over them one shepherd, my servant David. So God's saying, I'm going to do it. But then God goes, it's going to be through this person, my servant David, and he will feed them. He will feed them himself and be their shepherd. And I, the Lord, will be their God. And my servant David will be prince among them. I, the Lord, have spoken. So God's talking about how he's going to come to rescue the people. He's going to come and seek and save the lost. And then in verse 23, he says, yes, I'm going to do it, but I'm going to do it through my servant, David, talking about a son of David, the prince, the Messiah, the anointed one who is to come. And when Jesus says, for the son of man came to seek and to save the lost, Jesus is saying, I am the answer. I am the fulfillment. The leaders of Israel are still failing the people, and I'm the one who is restoring people back to the flock. I'm the one restoring people back to God's family. And in my work and in what I am doing, I am becoming king. Because friends, remember, this is happening in Luke 19. And Jesus is doing this all throughout his ministry. But remember, Jesus is going up to Jerusalem to become enthroned as the king of the universe through his death and his resurrection. And so it's just so fascinating to me that in Jericho, the last stopping point before Jerusalem, Jesus has this encounter with Zacchaeus. He says, for the son of man, this language, Jesus says, I'm getting the world. I am taking it over. I am king of kings. I am Lord of lords. And he's going to be enthroned through his death and through his resurrection. And in the meantime, he is saying, for I am seeking and saving the lost. Friends, this would have been explosive on the lips of Jesus in the midst of the context and in the midst of this incredible story. 
And so that's the power behind that. But I think it just even goes one level deeper. And this is just going to be very, very, very brief, is that Jesus is accomplishing the entire story. He's talking about how he has come to seek and save the lost. And as I just think about this language, I can't help but think about what's just happened a few weeks ago with the boys' soccer team in Thailand, where the 12 boys and the coach through just incredible rains and flooding, got lost in a cave system and then got trapped in a cave system. And for all of us, I would imagine this is a story that all of us are aware of because it was all over the news for days. They were trapped for two weeks and people were doing everything they possibly could. Somebody died in the midst of this. People were offering their services. Elon Musk sent a small submarine, you know, type thing that may or may not have worked appropriately. And people are doing everything thing they can to try to seek and save those who were lost. And I remember the day that they were all successfully brought out of the cave. I got a ping on my phone from the weather channel. I only get these when a storm is underway. And yet it says breaking news, all 12 boys and coach rescued from Thai cave. And I just remember sitting there and thinking about this Zacchaeus story and going, this is exactly what Jesus is doing in his ministry. He is seeking and saving lost. He is going to whatever length and extent necessary in order to rescue those who have just lost the plot, who have gotten off track, who have lost the sense of what their identity and calling is in the world. And Jesus goes, I am the one who is getting them back. And friends, it just harkens back to the whole Luke 15 story. We've made the connection in this series that there's so much going on between Luke 19 and Luke 15. And in this story, Jesus tells three stories about people being rescued. And it culminates with the father running and embracing his younger son and ultimately walking out to the older son. And this father is doing everything he possibly can to bring back those who have been lost. And this is what Jesus is doing in his ministry. It's what Jesus is telling the stories about. It's what he's enacting. It's what he's doing. And the exclamation point that Jesus makes with the Zacchaeus story is he says, For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Explosive on a number of different counts. So friends, there you go. There's another facet of the Zacchaeus story. So feel free to head over to walkingthetext.com. I'm going to have questions for you to go a little bit deeper with some of the ideas presented in this teaching. Feel free to leave your questions as well. A number of things will be linked under there for you to go and look at in connection to the Bible Project. And stay tuned for next week because we're going to look at another facet of the Zacchaeus story. I believe that there's an entire prophet or a prophetic book that is informing the the story in ways that when I saw this for the first time seven months ago, it got me super excited to eventually do a series what we're doing right now. So I will look forward to seeing you next week, but between now and then, and always, may you walk out the text well in your life. 